Hi, I'm Celia Ward. I just finished talking to the great Kara and really famous. We had so much fun. This is Really Famous. I'm Kara Mayer Robinson, and I interview famous people. But I don't just interview them like your typical interview. I'm not really interested in those same old questions. Instead, I like to know who they really are and what they really think. Today, I'm sitting down with Cela Ward. Yeah, wow, Cela Ward. So she's an Emmy winner. You may remember her from the television series Sisters or Once Again. She also starred in CSI New York. She was in House and Graves, and she had a very memorable cameo in Westworld. Plus, you may not remember this, she played Harrison Ford's wife, Helen Kimball, in The Fugitive. What a movie! And with Tommy Lee Jones, too. She's been in many other films too, like The Stepfather, The Day After Tomorrow, Gone Girl, and Independence Day Resurgence. Now you can see Sela every Tuesday night at nine o'clock on the CBS television series FBI. It's the newest criminal procedural from Dick Wolf. You know him, he's the guy who created Law and & Order and is behind all the other Law & Orders. So yeah, Sela plays the boss, Dana. Again, you can catch FBI Tuesdays at nine o'clock. Sela is also pretty active in advocacy. She's a child advocate. And in the year 2000, she founded Hope Village for Children to give vulnerable children a home. It's in Mississippi, which is where Sela is from, and it has helped thousands of kids over the years. Big shout out this week to Sophie Tell New York, where Sela and I recorded this episode from a beautiful corner suite on a high floor overlooking Midtown Manhattan, including a nice peek at the Empire State Building. Thank you, Sophie Tell. Bonus for you, if you'd like to see Sela answering some of my questions, subscribe now to my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash really famous. Just press pause right now if you'd like. Open your YouTube app, type in Really Famous, and subscribe so you won't forget later. And you'll get notified as soon as the video is ready. Oh, and one last thing before I give you Seal Award. Now is your chance to get a personalized private episode of Really Famous to give as a gift or to keep for yourself. If you'd like me to interview someone in your life, you, a family member, friend, colleague, Click in the episode notes right now. We're running a holiday special that expires soon. You can get a personalized interview in the form of a really famous podcast episode that won't air here, but that you can air anytime you like on your own personal devices or in front of the whole family, let's say at a holiday gathering or in a big conference room to kick off your next conference at work. Just an idea. But if you like this before the holidays, please get started like yesterday. So that's that. And now here is Sela Ward. You're in New York because you're filming FBI here, right? It shoots in New York, correct? Right, right. We shoot in Brooklyn. And there are a lot of episodes, so you're here a lot. You're here for a long time. But don't you live in Mississippi? Is that true? Well, I live between Mississippi and, and New York. Um, I've been dying to come back to New York since I left in my 20s, and I went out to L.A. in 1990, no, 83, 1983. Oh, my God. And I realized I, I looked at L.A. as a place to work, not to live. So I'd finish working and I'd hop on a plane and come back to New York, or I'd go to Mississippi and see my family. <laughs> and this went on for years. And I'd be stuck on shows for six years or four years or three years. or And uh, then in the 90s, got married and had two children and... Um, and then you're in school. So you're, you know, you're kind of stuck where your kids are in school. So right. I've been out there for a long, long time. And I'm so happy to be back in New York. And, and working on FBI gives me a purpose for being here, which is great. Instead of just showing up and going, okay, here I am, a whole new life. Yeah, right? you're li actually living here again. Right, right. So how many episodes is it? Are you, 22. It's 22. 22. So what do you good old-fashioned network That's a lot. scenario. Of 
Yeah. So what is it like eight business days or something to complete one episode? Is that how it is for Sometimes you guys? Sometimes we do nine. Okay. But on the average eight, eight uh, days to shoot one show. Yeah. How many of those days are you actually shooting yourself? Most of them? Um, no, no. I, I really, I'm the boss in this show. So I really am not doing the heavy lifting of uh, historically for shows that I've done. It's really um, a wonderful job. I may average three days a week. That's nice. Uh, which is great, which is exactly what I was looking for. And um, love Dick Wolf, and uh, he and I have tried to work together many times over the years, and it was just never the right time or a project. And so here I am, it's just perfect. He had offered uh, a couple of uh, roles. We had the same entertainment lawyer. We'd have dinners and, and things together. And we really, I'm very fond of him. We had all talked about trying to figure out something to do, and either I'd just taken a different job or... You know, the timing never worked out, but uh, but it finally did. So, and it's fun. It's fun. It's a different world. Do you shoot on the streets like Law and Order much, or you're normally like in the office more? I'm in the office a lot. So you're but not the one to, I've heard that's interesting too with Law and Order, how like, you know, New York, it's all about Dick Wolf being on the street. Yeah. Not himself, yeah. but. Yeah. Well, I did CSI New York and we would come here um, a week a sh let's see, a week, a couple of weeks a year, a season to shoot establishing shots outside in the city. So I've, um, I've done a, a movie here. So I've done, I've shot on the streets in New York a lot. And yeah, I'm sure most of the time they go, is that a Dick Wolf show shooting? Because uh, he's certainly been around shooting here for a long time. Um, and I don't, I don't have uh, a lot out of the office, but I'm noticing as scripts are coming in more, um, of Dana out in the field. Now, did your husband just run for Senate? He did. He ran for Senate in Mississippi, where we do have a home, and that is our base. Um, but I'm working here, which keeps me here till for the moment. Um, he did. He. Um, we really wanted, as a team, to to make a difference with no agenda. Really, at my entire adult life, uh, Mississippi has been number fifty in everything that matters: education. Uh, the lowest per capita income, like health care, everything ranking. Yes. So um, we tried. Uh, unfortunately, he was, you know, he was running as a Democrat and um, there hasn't been a Democrat elected in Mississippi in 30 years to the Senate. Uh, the timing was a little premature. Um, and also it, it, you know, you, it's it, it, politics are fascinating. We were very, very naive going into this process. And when you see the alignment of agendas, when people are career politicians and what they have at stake um, to lose their their standing or lose face or, you know, what to who is this outsider coming in, even though we've had a home there for 27 years, you know, they felt like you're an outsider oh, because you're not in politics and, and raised here, you know, uh, Howard. And so it was, it was disappointing because, um, even though he is my husband, he's brilliant and, uh, really had amazing ideas for, uh, bringing in, uh, industry and income into this poorly deprived state. But um, you've got to have people who are on the same wavelength and want that. And it's just Mississippi's not ready for change. I don't know. I don't live there, but I imagine there aren't that many Democrats, period. Right? No, or did, you find, did they kind of come out to say, okay, we have somebody representing us now, you know, not the usual suspects or not so much? Um, there, well, there are a handful of uh, secret Democrats, I should say, because, you know, you're living in, in um, a very rabid uh, right wing, uh, Christian right, uh, you know, very extreme sort of um, milieu. And uh, there's not a lot of, um, you know, it's also, if you think about it, the state is only about three million people. Or a little or a little less um and you know a lot of people have not traveled um the education is not great uh so you have a lot of limiting forces at play but it was probably one of the most extraordinary experiences uh of our lives to date because getting out and really seeing the state that i was born and raised in 
up and down uh, from the coast to the Delta, meeting the most extraordinary people and seeing what's ha- the positive things that are happening in Mississippi, the grassroots things um, of people really giving of themselves and extending their hand to others uh, was just was really uplifting. Yeah, so, so I wouldn't even, take anything for the experience. Right. You can't just because you don't win what you had set out. To, you are gaining so much in the process. You know, you can't give that back. Oh, no. And I wouldn't take anything for it. I'd do it all over again. Yeah. So you grew up in Mississippi. And then I read that you went to the University of Alabama. Right. Right. I did. And you were a cheerleader. Yeah. yeah. So you did the whole football thing. The, the SEC whole thing, thing with Bear Bryant there. It was a really exciting time. It was just bigger than life. Then you decided it was time to move to New York, and I and tell me if this is true or not. I read that you went to work for an ad agency. Is that true? I did. I wanted a bigger world. I really wanted to to see the world, and you know, the uh, as much as I love the South, it is homogenized. And it's a very specific culture, and I I needed to experience a, a bigger a bigger place out there. And um, New York, I was obsessed with. I, I just had to live here. And uh, But why? Did you see it on TV or something? No, I, I actually, the first time I ever came here was to cheer for the NITs, the basketball tournaments for Alabama. And the experience of being here, I just walked around wide-eyed and just mesmerized that this, this big, huge, fabulous city it was electric to me that I when I had to be here so I ended up I was a a fine arts major drawing up storyboards at this audiovisual production company so this was back when they didn't have video if you can imagine and so if like American Express for example wanted to have a sales meeting then we you would have and you were doing a presentation you'd have these synchronized slide projectors stacks of them and that's what I would draw up the storyboards for like what would come what would come first then it would fade out and it would morph into something else and fade out and different scenes and things having to do with the company. And that was before video. So you had to actually drop those storyboards and um, it was just a whole different time and place. But I was starving. You know, I was making like $6.50 an hour in 1979. (laughs) Somebody said, you should model because you can make $100 an hour. I went, oh my Lord. Okay, where do I go? And I, I met Wilhelmina and... Um, started there doing TV commercials for Maybelline Mascara and Vidal Sassoon Shampoo and the print for that. And then that was, uh, I got into this crazy business because I would start acting classes to help me with the commercial auditions. Oh, uh, okay. And I loved it. I just loved it. And all of a sudden, I had this passion for something I'd never dreamed about. Right, so they weren't just putting you in print ads then, they were putting you in, in actual video. So you, they were right. doing video, you yeah. were being introduced to it in a exactly. different way. Exactly. Well, it wasn't video, remember? It oh, was film. film. Of course. Yeah. It was actual film that was, would go in the can right. when it's done, and Correct. that's how in the can, right, started. So you took acting classes to help you with that, and you were just hooked. done, like hooked? Absolutely hooked. We, I went What'd to you like? uh, here in New York, um, uh, studied with this guy, Bob McAndrew, who uh, uh, began teaching at Winham and Studio, the American Place Theater. And Bob had this delightful group of young wannabe actors. And we had uh, a theater type setting where the class was with the stage and we would all help each other, you know, with our showcases and help with the sets and the costumes and, and the whole thing. And um, it was like going to a little club and everybody go out for beers after. And uh, it just it was just a special, special time. Community. Sense of community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. So then what happened after that then? I guess at that point somebody offered you or said, why don't you try audition for this? Well, I did a play as a showcase in that class, right? And I got an agent here in New York and um, I got offered a daytime soap. It was One Life to Live and I had, I think, two or three days on it. And I thought, oh my God, if this is what acting is like, I, I I can't do this. Okay, I mean, I'm I'm studying Chekhov, right? And here's assembly line production. The director's in some booth somewhere. You do your little scene. I was playing Nurse Bunny Cahill. That should tell you everything about my role. Every scene had to do with, Hi, doctor. I just picked up some apple pie. Would you like some? Uh, Hi. I mean, it was inane and. Um, and you would you'd be doing the scene, and then you know you'd you'd finish that take, and the the 
cameras would start rolling away, literally, to the next set, which was right beyond that wall. And I'd go, I'm sorry, could I do that one more time? But you're looking up like the wizard behind a curtain. Where is the director? I have no idea. I'm some booth somewhere. I mean, talking That's to so you over weird. an they intercom. They weren't on the stage? No, like? no, no. And this was just set? nothing like what I was studying. So I thought, gosh, if I'm going to... If I'm going to do this, I'm going to Los Angeles. So I packed up my bags and um, had some savings and checked into the Beverly Hilton Hotel. And, oh, um, swanky. Two weeks later, I had a job on The Man Who Loved Women with Blake Edwards directing with Burt Reynolds. So that's a nice first gig out there. It was there. a nice first gig. But how, So how did you go out there with, I mean, so you had a little bit of money. I had saved money. So Because yeah, okay, I'd enough, been working for five right. years. That's pretty good, though, to come to New York and be able to save money at that point. That's You were doing all right. Yeah. And then you took it to L.A. and you got that gig right away. So was this a different agent then that you needed in L.A.? Or was it kind of the same person who this helped you get that? This was actually through a someone connected me to a friend of theirs who was a manager. And she at the time, uh, Dolores Robinson, had actually... Uh, was under the umbrella of uh, Blake Edwards' company. And um, she says, ah, I know a part that hasn't been cast in this film. And picks up the phone and calls Blake's office. They were already filming. So I went and met uh, Blake and in his trailer. And he had me read and stops before the scene is over and goes, okay, you got the job. You know, I'm going, oh, my God. And it was with Burt Reynolds, my scenes. And that was when Burt was, you know, in his heyday. And um, Were you starstruck? Well, I was very nervous. I, I'm nervous more than anything. It's just like being plopped into some altered universe, and you're it's, you're you're really kind of having an out of body experience the whole time. <laughs> but um, I will never forget the kindness of Blake Edwards and his uh, appreciation for a young actor and nurturing um, talent. And he sent me to Nina Foch, who. Uh, he was very close with he and Julie Andrews, um, and she had coached Julie and, and them for a long time as an acting coach, and she, in her own right, was a wonderful stage actress. So I studied with her. She introduced me to Alexander Technique. I mean, I, I just, it was a very warm, nurturing experience uh, for my first thing in Hollywood. And uh, then it just took off after there? Did yeah. you have any lulls where you felt like worried or frustrated or anything? Or you felt like it Not at going? the beginning, but, um, you know, I had a long way to go. I mean, I had really only been studying for a year. I was 27. That's late, you know, in mm. these days to start. Now you know? It, seems, it seems so yeah, young. It does. It really does. But um, so I was never an ingenue in this business, you know. I had to work really hard uh, for a long time. And um, I would do jobs and not be so great, and um, or I'd be decent, but the movie didn't do great, and they were all movies couldn't get arrested in television. Really? And, and you, uh, did you try, and you couldn't get arrested? Yeah, in it? yeah. That's and, so and, funny because everybody would think it's the opposite. But at that point in time, um, the the two mediums were completely. Um, segregated, really. Right. They but were, didn't didn't each everybody want to make it in film more than TV? Yes. Yes. And so here you were, but here you couldn't I was, get anything. But I couldn't. That's nobody so would hire me for a TV show because I was a film person. When this, you know, I, that was a handful of things. But then I was offered a, a television show. The uh, Shapiro's, who had were produced Dynasty, and Dynasty was so hot at the time, did a uh, wanted to do this show called. NAS, uh, Naval Air Station, uh, I forget what point, I can't remember the name of the show. Um, and it had all of these amazing actors in it. It had Robert Vaughn and Jill St. John and Susan Day and Patrick O'Neill and Richard Dean Anderson and this this crazy list of, of actors. Um, so I took that show. And once I took that show, that was really it. I, I was in television forever. And that um, switched everything. Switched well, everything. Right, but you were still in movies after that as yeah, well. Yeah, I did, I did movies after that, but yeah, I would a do... A small movie called The Fugitive. Yeah, and I, that, but right? I was finishing, I was on Sisters under a six-year contract, and they let me out to go do The Fugitive, oh, which was, was so awesome because you're sort of stuck, you know, So how did um, that work out then? You're right in the middle of Sisters, which is a huge show, and that was a network too, probably, right? right so you right. were doing it like all year. Right. And then what happened with The Fugitive? They worked it out so that I could go to Chicago um, two different times. That's where The Fugitive was filming. 
and uh, on two separate occasions for like, you know, about a week or 10 days worth of work. So I, they were kind enough to let me out, which was such a, a, a wonderful experience because Harrison Ford, oh my Lord, you know, when I was in high school, I, I was gaga over and I'm, and now I'm playing his wife and, um, it was, um, it was really special and he's such a cool guy. Um, very, very down to earth and, um, yeah, that's like a dreamy situation. Yeah, I was dreamy, really dreamy. And uh, so I've had some really great experiences. Um, so let's go back to Sisters for a sure. second. That was pretty popular. Or, or, or like, do you have like one of those niche, you know what I mean? A lot of people are so into like very um, deep fans of a show. I feel like Sisters was probably like yeah. that. Was I think it? I get stopped more for Sisters um, anything than else? anything else. Interesting. Yeah. And you but, played Teddy. Teddy, which mm-hmm. was the rebellious, recovering alcoholic uh, sister, the black sheep of the family, if you will. And um, something about that show really struck a chord with women. I mean, women always tell me, oh, I was Teddy, or I was, you know, Julian Phillips' character, or I was Fra- you know, Frankie, or I was this or that. And they could see themselves in these characters, and they would watch it together, and... Um, I mean, it really struck a chord with people. And it's, it was on for six years. That's a long time to be in somebody's living room. It is, yeah. right. Week after week. Yeah. They feel like they yeah. know you, especially because yeah. you're going through like personal struggles on the show. I really do feel like that helps people or makes them feel like they know you. Even if it's your character, they still feel like they know yeah. you. Sure. So people stop you and it's usually, oh, Teddy, is that what they say? Yeah, yeah. Who else do they think of? Other people who stop you. Um... It depends on what, I'll, I'll get the oddest things that I, I would think that people, it would be a movie that, you know, I felt like I had 10 minutes in, you know, <laughs> especially in Europe, I'll get stopped for things like Day After Tomorrow or uh, CSI, New York and well, CSI in is Paris huge over there, right? Yeah, it's huge. Huge. Um, stuff like that. Who was, I heard somebody talking about something like that. Who could it have been, was Ted Danson on it? CSI, or am I think of NCIS? No, but he was on another one. He was on um, something. I think it was him talking about the fact that for years he was on it, and here in the U.S., it was like people were like, "Oh, what have you been up to?" And mm-hmm. then he would go there, and he was like a major superstar while it was on. I think it was Ted Danson who was talking about. Yeah, that. he was on, and because he they cross bordered He did um, CSI New York uh, for a couple episodes. I forget which one he was on. Okay. But it was one of them, the same mm-hmm. thing, where exactly. in Europe it was gigantic. Yeah. So when you go there now, that's what people think yeah. of right off the yeah. bat. Or or a movie. Mm. Uh, interesting. So you just you just never know. Careers are so interesting, aren't they? Yeah. It's a road. You just you just never know you, what path you're going down ever. Right. And where it's going to lead you. Are you the kind of person who kind of was always looking at the next possible step, or like? just waiting to see what happens or what um i you know i wish you could plan a career like this um but you really can't things extraordinary uh opportunities come and you they're right your fingertip and then at the last minute up sorry you should have come to read for me in my house oh you know (laughs) things like that it fall under that me too category that oh, really? um, not, nothing just just producer saying oh no come read for me well I already read for the director the director chose me humongous movie would have changed my career overnight what movie I can't tell you that because oh. then yeah I don't, I don't want to I don't like talking about all that in the, the context because nothing right. happened except well no come and read for me at my house you know a producer and I went no I if you if to, the director wants me to come back great I'm not coming to your house to read you know but it cost me a career changing job a humongous movie um and I you know I for young women in particular and and young actors I, I think about this a lot that you never really know where a road is going to take you and it might at the moment seem like on the on the surface the best thing that could ever happen but you just never know and particularly if you listen to um, a lot of the actors, actresses who um, were really egregiously dealt with in that Me Too movement, who's, who's the, the guy squashed their career. Um, so you never, ever know, A, what you're going to get into and what it would cost you. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's whether, you know, people didn't hop on that plane that went down because of somebody right. made him late or they had a sick child or whatever the deal was. You know, you just never know. And I never question anymore. So do you look back on that and think you kind of look at those things and just say it is what it is? Um, at this point, I do. But what I'm really left with, and in particularly, yes, I do. The answer to that question is yes, because I don't really question anymore. If uh, if you have to push the boulder up the hill like Sisyphus, you know, to work so hard for something, I think things that are meant to become much more effortlessly. Um, I think everything just sort of goes your way in that moment toward whatever it is you're trying to achieve or uh, working toward. And when you have to work too hard and push too hard, it's just not the, 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 you know, the universe, universal energy is not flowing in that direction. I really believe that. And um, uh, if I have to work too hard or push too hard, I just sort of let go and and step back. And I think that, um, you know, there's so many, it, it, so many things happen that really are just for learning and a learning only. It's not so much about what you do with it or what has it. You know, it it it's what do you get from that, and how do you move forward, and what is your decision making later? I I, I want to go back to something that I think is so important in the in the um, wake of that whole Me Too situation, even in my situation where um, I certainly wasn't dealing with anything like that, um, like the, you know, the, all that Weinstein mess. But I I think that if young women were educated, if, 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 if older women would be mentors and, and really talk to young women about the circumstances that we get into with men in the workplace um, and how to handle them. If somebody had talked to me about how to handle that situation um, of, no, I'm not going to that producer's house to read for him, right? Um, how to handle that, how to navigate that, because my male agent certainly didn't help me, right? Mm-hmm. Um, then, then you would know how to, you know how to navigate those waters without compromising things that are important to you. You would know how you would know how to have the strength and the wisdom and the judgment, and how to maneuver. And I think we as young women at the beginning really don't are not taught that. Um, and I think also just to be able to expect it, right? If somebody's already teaching you and mentoring you, then it wouldn't be such a shock. And in the moment, if something is happening where you need to make a decision like that or like take action or not take action or whatever you have to do, at least you're not that thrown off maybe as you would be if you didn't see any of it coming. Exactly. Right? You know what I mean? It's almost exactly. like a warning. Yeah. A preparation. It's a little handbook yeah. for life right. in right. the business place, right? But that's because... a tough handbook, though. What, how, what do you exactly write, right? But I think yeah. now it's becoming easier and easier um, to see. Because people are talking mm-hmm. about it. You know, the, it's, the rug has been sort of lifted. Yeah. It's a gift to all of us that, that all of this happened, really. Mm-hmm. It's a huge gift because um, the, the power structure, um, because it's your livelihood, you know, the compromises women felt they had to make. Yeah, it's insane. Just to survive, mm-hmm. you know. So do you feel like it's changed since everything happened? Because we're only talking about like a year ago. I think it was last October that it first came out about Harvey Weinstein, right? Mm-hmm. Was it mm-hmm. Oct- I think it was October a year ago. Um, so have you noticed a difference at all? Yes, you absolutely, have. 100%. Like and how? I'll hear it a lot from men or executives. Oh, you know, I'll even have I even had a transportation guy walk up to me the other day. And he said something about, uh, yeah, beautiful Sela, something like that. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Uh-oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it in any way that would be oh, offensive. He said that. Oh, he yes. And he starts, you know, apologizing quickly. I mean, he said, I know I'm not supposed to say anything like that, you know. And I was I was laughing. I said, hey, it's 62. I'll take that all day long. <laughs> <laughs> that is so fine. But, um, but I right. think people are yeah. much more aware of what they're saying and um, how they're saying it. But, you know, there's, there's this intrinsic male-female 
dance that um, particularly, you know, I grew up, I was born in 56, so in the 50s and 60s, you know, when you're when you're small, but your parents, your mama's uh, from that generation, you, um, you know, like the Mad Men era. So there, there is just a certain expectation of behavior between the male-female dynamic and the flirtation and the, the way to maneuver that and walk that fine line, you know, that's just intrinsic to, to the, to, you know, male, female animals. So, um, I think women are so used to having to walk that fine line in the business place and in life in general, that some of it is just your daily bread. You know, it's, it's when it goes, you know, there's an art to it that is great to teach young women to, um, to protect yourself, but also help take care of their ego. Uh, you know, there's so much for us to, to give to younger women. Do you have anybody who you kind of share this knowledge well, I with? Do. My daughter is, is 20, and she's a sophomore in college. So her and all of her friends, I'm constantly talking about, you know, these situations um, and and how to prepare yourself. And, and she wants to be an actress, you know. And, okay. um, uh, and I her have friends, a, too? Uh, no. Okay. Some of them. But some they're all of them. open to like gathering they're around all, and hearing they, yeah, your yeah, yeah, they, advice. They love to talk about all that. They're strong, you know, this generation. Um, now my kid grew, you know, grew up in Los Angeles and um, is in the East in school. So she's, she's, she's seen a lot and um, they're savvy and they're um, not that they're not that they're not vulnerable to all of these things, particularly when they, when you want something so badly in a career. Right. But, um, but they know how to say no. I agree. I have a daughter who's 18 and I can really see and my friends, kids at the same thing. Like we can really see they are, they kind of get things and they're not going to stand for a lot of the stuff that has happened before them or that we all think is just par for the course. Like we're like, Oh, that's just how it is. But they're like, no, that's not how it, that's not okay. Right. And that's what I was really talking about. That's just kind of how it is. Mad men world. Right. 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 (laughs) Exactly. And, uh, just got to figure out the, the tricks, you know, how to to walk that fine line. And she's like, you know, they're like, we can't, we're not going to just sit that. You can't, you you can't just say that. Like something has to be done. Like, I'm sorry if it's going to like upset the waters or whatever, but yeah. No, we're not yeah. going to accept that, which I think is amazing. And it's going to take that to really shift things around. I think so, too. So, I'm excited about the new generation of young women. I mean, my daughter, I, I, there were, you know, I grew up in a culture in the South, the Deep South, where, you know, you, everything was about manners and how you looked and how you spoke to people. And, you know, you're there to be seen, but not talk and, you know, that whole, whole deal. And, um and so I was careful not to squash my daughter. Um, and you have you pay a price when you do that because the confidence is with with adults is beyond the beyond. And you know some some adults just don't like that. Yeah, you know because they don't have they didn't have that right. And the world will tell her when when she's too confident or too arrogant or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Um, but I love that she has that. I love that she has she has that force that um, I will never take away from her. Absolutely. So is she your only child? I have a son. You have a son too. Yeah, my son is twenty four. Twenty four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And where is he? He's in L. A. Okay. So you're you're kind of everywhere then. You said you were in Mississippi a little bit. You have a house there. Mm-hmm. You're here in New mm-hmm. York. And you have a place in L.A. too. Mm-hmm. So like what's the time? Do you hop around a lot? It's or you... very difficult. The, you know, the fantasy that you want places, you know, in, in more than one place is, is really hard. It does seem great though. Right? It so seems somebody great, who's not doing right? It seems like ideal. But yeah. it's hard? It's hard because you lose connections with friendships and... You know, if I'm sitting here in New York and let's say I finish filming and it's January and it's freaking freezing and snowing and well, let's just go back to L.A., right? But you you really need to be in a place. You need to be here during the thick and the thin. You need to be here where people gather inside. You need to be here to maintain relationships, friendships. I mean, you know, there's if you really want to feel rooted to a community, you have to be there. Like root, actually rooted. Actually rooted. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's what I'm finding out. So it, it's hard. 
And your daughter is, you said she's in school on the East Coast? She's on the East Coast. She's so is in, she close to New York? She's or no? in Providence, so oh, she's okay. close. That's nice. Yeah. So at least you can train back and forth yep. and still be rooted here when mm-hmm. you're here. Exactly. And what does your son do in L.A.? Um, he works for a company called Cobalt, which is a music company, and he is his passion is music. He's really a, a wannabe musician, so he does his day job, and it's in the music industry, which he loves, and he loves Cobalt, and then he goes and works all night doing, you know, playing music, doing sessions with different musicians, and writing music and performing music, and you know. Um, I wish him luck. I think he's so talented, but I'm his mama. So he <laughs> just, <laughs> of course, but I love seeing, um, seeing him really doing what he loves, which yeah, is great. That you is just very... want your kids, you know, to succeed because it's what they want for their soul. So, um, but it's his journey and I'll keep my fingers crossed and he's working hard. It's all you can ask for. Yeah. And if he's passionate about it, then the work will come easily. Like obviously if he's out at night too, because he wants to, he loves it. He would do it all day and all night, all day and all night. So he's, he's on the right track. It sounds like to me. And of course, like we said before, like you don't know what this is going to lead to that, to that, to that. A hundred percent. But at least he's in the zone that he feels compelled to be in. Yes. Right. That, that's a gift, isn't it? Yeah. And so you're okay with your daughter going into acting like that feels good to you? It feels or no. You know why? Because she has since she was two years old, wanted to be an actress and her whole behavior. She's a very extroverted um, young woman. And I'm very introverted. This did not spring naturally from me at all. I was very shy. Um, but she's not and she's um, this is so much uh, better suited for her as a profession than it was for me and uh, she has all the stuff it's just a matter of you know luck and hard work so are you still shy not anymore not at not all anymore but I've, I've worked I've worked really hard on that and um, and the more you put yourself out there, the easier, you know, as you know, with anything in life, right? Right. It's like, uh, um, act as but if. my, my, my nature is, is, uh, introverted? more introverted. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to sit back and observe and, you know, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just who I am. Yeah. You know, my son's like that too. He's quieter, thoughtful. Checking watching, everything out. Checking it out, taking it in. Analyzing it all. Yeah, yeah Coming exactly. up with theories or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So when you go out, but you have to be social in this business that you're in. Mm-hmm. So you've learned how to kind of weave that into your yeah, introversion. I don't enjoy going to um, a lot of things that are... Uh, large events where where they're not personal, you know, they're very impersonal. Um, people look from the outside in and go, oh my gosh, you get to go to those glamorous things. But the truth is, it's a lot of work to get dressed. <laughs> and uh-huh. act with today's world of people taking photographs, you know, when you don't even know it. And, um, you know, you have to have hair and makeup done and find an outfit. And, oh, my Lord, by the time you finish, it's <laughs> you're exhausted. Right, before you even get there. Before you even get there, yeah. So I go to the things that really speak to me that I'm passionate about and um, and that matter to me. And I, I, my energy at this point in life is precious, my time and energy. What do you do in your off time? Well, I am a painter. That was my major in college. And um, uh, I've got a little studio space here in New York and uh, try to get in there whenever I can. Oh, that's cool. So you have your own space right here that you can just go to whenever you're feeling creative or like you have something to express. Yes, yes. So it's it's really, really special and and so much part of my soul. Um, And I, I love to travel. So I, you know... But having said that, it's really to those heart places, you know, to the farm in Mississippi and uh-huh. um, and back to L.A., mostly to see my son. Los Angeles is not not my sole place. I love the East Coast. I love the South. I love New York. I, you know, mm-hmm. I'm happy being on the seaboard. Yeah. The Eastern seaboard. I feel you. So do do you have the holidays like here or do you go? Yeah, we'll be here for Thanksgiving and we'll go to the farm for Christmas. Okay. And, uh, 
So that's, it all works out. It but then works. when you want to travel somewhere else, though, you're probably like torn, like, oh, but I have, I want to see my son in LA. I want to go back to Mississippi. But Correct. I also want to go to wherever, Paris. Do you have that? Yeah, issue? and Paris, you know, is on the bottom of the list. Oh, is it? <laughs> you're, you're trying to make the circuit, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, take advantage of what, of what you have. So what I'd like to do is set up a little quick video and I'm going to do some kind of quick answers and we'll include that on the podcast. Uh, but before we do that, I just have like two questions that I want to make sure that I get to. Any life regrets or any things that you look back on and think, oh, if only I had or I, I didn't want to, but I kind of wish that I had. Well, those would all involve men where I was <laughs> like... Gee, if I had just gotten out of those relationships much faster. Um, but there again, I think it, it takes hitting the wall in certain circumstances in relationships in order to extricate yourself from ever choosing that again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, right, for it to really sink in. Yeah. So that you really internalize it and know what to do with it later. Correct. Because if you did do it too quickly, maybe, and then you would keep repeating it, possibly. Correct. But that's my only, if, if I were to have a regret, that would be it. It's just being in relationships that didn't serve mm -hmm. me. Um, but there's a reason why you choose those. So you have to, you have to work all that out until you can, so that you can choose something different. Yeah. Better for for yourself you have you to know. be a yeah. little introspective yeah exactly and do a little analysis yeah why did i go there exactly and something that you that you learned about life that you want to pass on to your daughter or your son oh just not to be afraid you know i think fear stops us from so many things um and it's hard because you know we all want guarantees in life and um there are none, but there's really nothing. Okay, I'm, I'm not talking about the world at the moment because the world at the moment is very frightening. So, but aside from that, just in your journey in life, whether it's relationships or whether it's work or whether it's, uh, you know, the, your art or your music or your acting or your whatever your passion is, you could be the greatest rose gardener, you know. Um, the fear oh i can't do that oh i have to make you know got to too much i have to make enough money to do this or that i mean all those kinds of decisions that we make out of fear um it, it's just it paralyzes us so how did you learn that the hard way or an easy way i think really um i was so fearful for so long younger uh that I, I, I worked really hard to try to get on the other side of that and understand, um, you know, with that famous quote from, I don't know whether it was Churchill or wh whoever it was, I think I don't, I'm attributing it to the wrong person, I think, but there's nothing to fear but fear itself. And I, I finally got that that's really true. What are you really afraid of? You know, that I'm going to be, I'll fall on my face and not get that job or... Or, or, or what is I'm really, really mm -hmm. afraid of, you know, that people don't won't like me, that, um, you know, and, and when you really ask yourself that question and keep distilling it down, well, then what and what else and what else? Then you get to, well, really, I guess none of that matters, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah well, um, it takes the heft out of it, right? Yeah. The weight out of it. Exactly. And then it's no longer, it doesn't have the strength that it had before. Right. So you ready for the quick answers? What makes you nervous? What makes me nervous? Not a lot anymore. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Um, I'm not a great flyer. The news makes me nervous. The world makes me nervous. Trump makes me nervous. What keeps you up at night? The world, Trump. <laughs> um, the meanness in the world right now, particularly in our country. That keeps me awake, makes me sad. Is it hard to read the news for you? To read even the headlines? Um, yeah, uh, it is. It's a very troubling time and it, it makes me, first and foremost, very sad for my children. 
because I didn't grow up in this. Although the reality is that, you know, if you know anything about history, this is just one big circle and this too shall pass. And it'll come back to some stabilization and normalcy and kindness. And then it'll repeat itself again. We're just animals, aren't we? I'm ready for it to keep going around. Yeah, we need come to go back the other way. <laughs> hurry Please, up. Hurry, hurry up and up. Make it, get out of this <laughs> cycle. Speed that cycle up. What cracks you up? Oh, gosh. Like Peter Sellers' movie, The Party. What was your favorite TV show when you were a child? Dark Shadows. What were your 20s like? My 20s were really fun um, because I, I left the South at 20 and moved to New York. And um, that chapter was just, my all of my 20s were just fantastic, just full of wide-eyed, bushy-tailed, oh my God, there's a big world out there and I want it, you know? Um, it was a great time, the 20s. If you could choose two celebrities to be your parents. Oh my God, my parents. Yes. My parents. Um, it's so funny, the first thing that came to my mind was Doris Day. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and who's your dad? The dad. Who would the dad be? Oh wow, so many great actors. Um, Jimmy Stewart. Always a good choice. Yeah. Are you a good driver or a bad driver? I'm a really good driver. Where'd you learn how to drive? Mississippi. Do you at drive 15, in New York? We got our license at 15. Oh, 15. Uh-huh. So we could drive tractors and things. <laughs> Do you drive in New York? Yeah. And are you good in New York? Not bad. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say it's fun to drive in New York. Where's the best place to drive? Um, I spend a lot, I have great friends in Philly, so I'll go to Philly a lot. Bucks County, so nice to go antiquing and uh, drive out to the beach, whether it's the Jersey Shore or whatever, in anywhere. It's just a great little day trip adventure. If you invited me over for dinner, what would you prepare for me? Probably not much, since I don't cook. <laughs> not, not into <laughs> cooking, huh? Not into cooking, but I could have a delicious dinner for you. So where do, would you take it out from? Where's your favorite place? I'd probably have somebody make it. What's your most dreaded household chore? Most everything involved with the house. <laughs> <laughs> Including cooking. Including cooking. I'm a working gal. You know, it's funny. You, you just miss a whole skill set. What item can you never resist? An item? An or item. F- something you see at a store or something on a menu. Anything. Mm. Well, the first thing that came to my head was not so much an item, but hardware stores. I love. What? Hardware stores. But you don't like household chores and whatnot, but do you like no, building I things? I love preparing for all those things and organizing for all those things. So hardware stores are just, I could just spend all day in a hardware store. Really? Uh, and bookstores. I love bookstores. What's your favorite bookstore? Book Soup at the moment, because there's so few left. Book Soup in LA on Sunset. Do you read on a Kindle or like, what do you do? How do you read now? No, I don't, you know, I'm just of a different generation. I don't, I don't like reading electronically. I like the paper. I like the tactile part of it, even a newspaper. Um, oh, you read the print news still? Yes. I love it. You know, it's just it's just very different. I can look at it and decide I want, oh, let me look back at that page and this, I, and I'm very visual. So it really bugs me to have to swipe and go back. If you weren't an actor, what would you be? A doctor. Really? Yeah. What kind? Um, I'm not really sure. Probably an internist. Did you think about becoming a doctor at some point? Because no, you're a fine I, arts major. I was, but my mama took my chemistry set away from me in the fifth grade when I had gone to the library on my own to learn all the abbreviations for the elements. I was obsessed with chemistry, afraid I was going to blow myself up or poison myself. Poor little girls at that point in time, right? So um, medicine, I'm just fascinated by. That is amazing. I can't get enough of the research. I want to know more. Um... And you didn't hesitate at all when I asked you that. Like, right away. Yeah. Doctor. (laughs) What's one acting role that got away? Every great female role. (laughs) That would be the answer. Because you're always looking as an actress in particular. Oh, my God, what an amazing role for a woman. Um, 
but they, you know, I've had some great roles and I've worked with um, really talented actors, so I have no regrets on any of that. And last question, what's something that people would never guess about you? Ah, uh, that probably, well, the first thing that came to my mind is that you'd see me barefooted in blue jeans and a t-shirt at the farm. That's what I live in. That's what I live in in LA. But um, just just uh, easy breezy casual with my bare feet on the ground. Thank you so much, Celia. Thank you. Did I seem a little different to you during this interview? I don't know, I felt a little different and I'm pretty sure it's because we had a major time constraint going on um, and I think it was weighing on me, especially at the beginning. But if you have an opinion about that, reach out to me, let me know, I'm curious. Also, remember to get your personalized Really Famous episode today or yesterday. The special promo ends like almost immediately. And if you want it before the holidays, well, you know, it's now or never. There's a link in the show notes. I'm Kara Mayer Robinson. This is Really Famous. I've been releasing episodes weekly now, have you noticed? Um, On a pretty steady basis. Did you notice? Do you like it? Does it matter? Do you care when the episodes come out? Let me know. I'm sort of a feedback junkie, so reach out to me and tell me at reallyfamouspodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to Really Famous. I love having you as a listener. Stay tuned for more authentic talk with spectacular people. Hi, I'm Celia Ward. I just finished talking to the great Kara and really famous. We had so much fun. Tune in to FBI, which is on CBS 9 o'clock Eastern Time, Tuesday nights.